gardens. Okay, so we were talking uh, at that point about how can a student look at a senior monk to see how that how that senior monk is is progressed because there's actual questions that you can ask that if they're if the question is answered correctly you can automatically put them at the state of whether they're noble or not now what i mean by the word noble is that basically it boils down to do they have already noble right view a super mundane right view and that super mundane right view um, comes about through the dissolution of the three lower fetters which we'll talk about in a moment so that puts one into state of nobility and that uh, that's actually the real hallmark. If we had the choice between having 100 Arahats and no other nobles versus 10,000 nobles, none of which were at the state of Arahat, I'd take the 10,000 very quickly. <laughs> because that state of nobility is kind of the foundation to whereby without gaining that one will never become uh, fully uh, free from suffering. But that uh, having a noble mind, one is already mostly free from suffering, especially because the virtue is really high. Now, there, what we mean by that is, is that there are certain aspects of the law of comma that are useful, valuable. If if you're if you're acting badly, then you're going then you probably already feel bad, but when you're acting badly around others, those others are going to have their own reaction back to you, giving you even more suffering. So it's kind of like in a feedback loop. All right. And that what we come to understand uh, in the path, you see, the way that it's stated in the Buddhist religion, that virtue comes first. But if you look at other suttas, you find out that basically what that means is that we have to come in our meditation practice up to the point so that we are firmly sure and firmly capable of that no matter how obstructed the mind is, we can throw that obstruction out and come to this present moment. That's the first step of one being, being a noble. What you can see is, is that it's very much like virtue. Why? Because if the mind is obstructed and we know the mind is obstructed, then we can throw that stuff out of the mind before it comes out of the mouth. And so our, our, our sila becomes quite good as we start to develop mentally. And so this is the first step. The second step then is going to be when, the, when we can actually get the mind completely purified so that there are periods of time when there are no obstructions there at all. When that, when that period of time when there are no obstructions there in the mind at all, when, and we mean by obstructions the hindrances that, that we've talked about before, and most specifically we're talking about a restless mind that goes back to the past or goes into the future in the sense of wanting things. Mm -hmm. So the wanting things that we don't have or wanting to finish arguments that we started wanting to finish fights that we've started, uh, wanting to get work done, all of that kind of stuff. And it's most noticeable when the student is sitting in meditation and he catches his mind just spinning, wanting, actually moving from one problem to another, to another, to another, which has basically wound up with the human beings uh, being nothing but problem-solving machines. 
but there's a lot of suffering involved with those problems. And so it's much better to throw all of that stuff out of the mind. And when we're capable of throwing it out and keeping it out for a while, then this is what is called first jhana, when the mind is pure. And Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa calls this a mind fit for work. Okay, and this is actually the second step of the noble path. Then the third step of the noble path is when we bring the Dhamma fully into it. When I say fully into it, just from the very get-go, we actually have to practice various aspects of the Eightfold Noble Path, whether we even know it or not. For instance, to, to be able to uh, do that first step, when the mind is free from hindrances, that means that we have to go through a process to free the mind from hindrances. The first thing that we have to do is have at least enough right view to know that right now I'm going to keep my mind free from hindrances. So that starts off with the right view. And then we need sati to remember to watch what's going on, to remember to be here now, to remember to throw the old crap out of the mind. The next one is the effort that it takes to do that. And when that effort is joyful, it's easy. Most students, when they're already stuck in a negative state and they realize that the mind has wandered away from the breath, they'll tend to stay in a negative state. Oh, the mind is a monkey mind. Oh, meditation is so hard. So we actually have to change our attitude to one of joy. Aha, I caught you. Aha, I can do this meditation. So uh, these four things that we've just talked about now are actually four aspects, the first four aspects of the Eightfold Noble Path. And we have to do that right from the very beginning. But by the time that we're capable of getting the mind um, <clears throat> using these things uh, up to that first jhana, now the mind is fit for work. <clears throat> And what we mean fit for work means that we can identify those things that are worthy of paying attention to. Because we've already begun to understand that the things that are not worthy paying attention to is what was happening in the past, what's going to happen into the future. What about me? Who am I? What am I? Where is all of this going? And all of those doubts and fears and things like this are actually hindrances of the mind and are not worth paying attention to. And we know they're not worth paying attention to because when we pay attention to those things, we begin to feel bad. We begin to feel morose. We can start to feel depressed. We can have all kinds of troubles because we can think of them. But now we're beginning to say, well, what is worthy of paying attention to? That's when the entire teachings of the Buddha comes into play. Marching in under the title or under the label of that the Buddha only teaches one thing. And that is suffering and no suffering. Dukkha and Dukkha Naroda. Now when I first heard that I said, well why doesn't he teach just the end of suffering? Why does he have to start teach suffering first before we teach the end of suffering? The answer is, is that if you don't know your enemy you won't be able to defeat him. You have to really come to understand the nature of suffering because that only then can we identify it and by identifying it. And so that's what we begin to start paying attention to is these four noble truths. Most specifically that there is suffering. But the really, really big one, the one that we spend so much time with is the second noble truth, the cause of suffering. And in that is, is much of what we're practicing with Anapanasati in meditation because we're identifying the suffering in the mind, which is in the form of hindrances, and throwing that stuff out and coming out of suffering. And we do that over and over and over again, moving from that second to the third noble truth over and over again so that we begin to get to know what that third noble truth is really all about. We can actually experience it. Oh, wow, well, this is what it's like to be free from suffering. Oh, I like this very much. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so this is what we mean by 
paying wise attention to those things that are worth paying attention to is in fact code for paying attention to the four noble truths in all of its various aspects. And that when we say all of its various aspects, what we mean by that is one by one as they come up, one by one as they occur. That basically what we get uh, through the, um, the Four Noble Truths is kind of a road map of the mind and how the mind works. That's all the way down to the teaching of Paticca Samuppada, which is dependent origination or how the mind actually works that takes us from ignorance through feelings into big feelings into suffering. That second noble truth. So the second noble truth in all of its detailed glory is called Paticca Samuppada, but is nothing more than the second noble truth. And this is where a lot of students get very confused. But this map is actually a map of the way that the mind works. So that means that it's not some sort of study matter like you take a history course and then you take an exam at the end of the course and now you get credit for having taken that course. No, what this map is, is more of what to look out for while you're going down the road of life. A kind of checklist to be watchful for. So, when we do actually pay close attention to these Four Noble Truths with a mind that's fit for work, when a mind is cleaned out and we can see things clearly, uh, that means that we're actually practicing the Dhamma or we're practicing it in, in the style of what is called Vipassana, which means very, very watching. Watch what's going on. We've got a detailed checklist of what to look for, and we've got our sati going so that we, we're going to remember to look. We're going to stay alert. We're going to keep watching. All right? This is also then the development of um, the right view, which is the most important quality of the Eightfold Noble Path. And so as we keep having right view, super mundane right view, over and over and over again, we develop compassion, we develop joy, we develop equanimity. All of these things come about as we're throwing out things that keep us from being full of joy, full of compassion, through, through the right uh, views and the right attitude. And in fact, Right view and right attitude are the two things that come first, and that's why they're so very important. But without, in fact, in, in one of the sutras, the Buddha talks about that right view, right, at, uh, right mindfulness, and right effort. Those three things run in circle around each other, and then you add in right attitude. So that right view circle, runs in circles around right um, or, excuse me, right sati and right effort run a circle around right view and right attitude so that they run kind of around each other like this. And we need all four of those just to get started on the path. But now that we're up at step three, working in step three of the third knowledge that is noble, super mundane, that's when we begin to understand really what the mind is all about, who we really are. And in that regard, then three fetters are abandoned in us. The first one and most important one is the abandonment of the idea, or let us even call it a doctrine of a self. Now, this is what religions teach. They teach that there is a self, that there is a soul. And that if we think through that whole idea using modern physics, and all we know about modern physics, we can see that story just breaks right down. But if we have some fear of death, if we do not understand the path, then we won't even look at it. We'll just say naturally, oh, there's a soul. Oh, I need that soul because I'm afraid to die. I want to live afterlife. 
But one of the qualities that really happens when we start to investigate deeply is we begin to recognize not only am I temporary, everything is temporary. Everything is temporary. Nothing lasts. Every person that you ever knew is either already dead or will be, including you. Of this, there is no doubt that there is no soul that goes on and on and on into the future. Some of the things that we can look at with with physics is to say, well, if everybody's got a soul, that means that there's 7 billion people. But wait a minute, the Hindus say, oh, no, you can also be an animal, so we got to bring in the animal kingdom, and now so we're not at 7 billion, let's say we're, we're probably closer to 100 billion. That's probably even a small estimate. But in any case, we're talking about uh, for each individual to have, let us call it a social security number or a telephone number or a common number or a soul number or a God number, because like issues with Hiroshima, when you have 100,000 people die all at once, how are we going to manage those souls? We've got to be able to identify them, right? That means the soul has to be complex enough to have some sort of identification to it that is sophisticated enough that it is going to be uh, capable of holding, say, a 20-digit number. Telephone numbers, they've only got nine digits. We need a 20-digit number for this guy to hold. It's going to have to be a fairly, fairly sophisticated molecule because we know down at the atomic level that, uh, that a hydrogen atom is indistinguishable for another hydrogen atom. And oxygen is the same way. Oh, no, it's got to be in some sort of complex arrangement, something like DNA, that's going to be able to hold such a high valued number so that souls can be kept track of so that they can get their proper thing you see (laughs) well dna is so sophisticated that it gets broken down after a few years in the grave it's no longer human dna now is worm dna that nothing will last and you can see just through modern physics there's no possibility to have a soul it just doesn't exist in the way that they talk about it in the sense that there's going to be something like a god that's going to pick you up like a football and kick you into whichever direction he wants to well if you look at it the underlying thing what you recognize is that oh this teaching of a soul is actually a way for organized religions to control people the way to get them to behave themselves for them the way that they're taught virtue is by fear of hell a fear of retribution this is the way that religions teach even the buddhist religion teaches this but that's not the teachings of the buddha the teaching of the buddha is to be free from suffering which means free from fear including not only free from death, but free from what's going to happen after you die. And so in that regard, the teachings of the Buddha is antithetical to religion, even though there is a Buddhist religion. And the funny thing is, is that that Buddhist religion is so close to the actual teachings of the Buddha that it takes quite a lot of thinking to move from one to the other. That we recognize, for instance, the precepts of Buddhism is not to keep the students out of hell after they die, is to keep them out of hell right now. (laughs) Right here, right now. That's what's valuable for it. Now, the thing that's quite interesting also about the Eightfold Noble Path is this list of precepts that they chant at the uh, temple in a ritualized way where they teach these precepts to the to the students all much of that is actually in the April noble path in the phrase of right speech except that in the April noble path the um it's got a difference to it following precepts because you were told to do it 
following precepts because of the fear of retribution, following precepts because it's the thing to do, etc., is very, very ordinary, and it winds up not being free from suffering. However, if you're following not the precepts, but you're following the step of right speech that is noble, super mundane, and a factor of the path, then that speech is going to be pure. We're not going to be telling lies. We're not going to be uh, gossip. And in fact, gossip is a very, very clear example of conceit. Where one person will tell person A says to person B something bad about person C. That's just merely gossip. And that's part of uh, the one who has a noble mind guards against that. Especially when the, the idea is to divide. In other words, A says to B something bad about C in order to get B to dislike or distance himself from C. But it is not malicious gossip, it's just merely idle gossip when A and B are talking together about C in the sense of ain't it awful. He's just a good friend of ours. Maybe we can help him, etc. like that. So they begin to plot, but it's not against him. They're plotting for him until you recognize, well, wait a minute, maybe he doesn't want them to be plotting against him. Is this malicious or is it not kind of gossip? The best thing to do is to be very careful about when you're talking about a third person. The same way then with uh, right action, that our actions are uh, noble depending upon our mind state. When the mind is noble, when we have super mundane right view, then our actions are also going to be noble in the sense of the teachings of the Buddha, suffering and no suffering. So if we're, ca- if we're engaged in speech or actions that cause myself or someone else suffering, then that means that I'm off the path into a ditch. Not on the path anymore. So, uh, but when we begin sitting quietly in a, in a posture that we call meditation or whatever like that, you can see that if the mind is wandering away, then it will be wandering away sometimes into idle gossip. It will be wandering away into false speech. It will be wandering away into ideas about wrong behavior. But if we can keep the mind clear in the sense of not thinking about the past, not thinking about the future, but staying in the here now, watching the body, watching the breath, uh, living that way, then in those moments, our virtue is perfect. Our sila is perfect. The speech is good. The action is good. I mean, I'm sitting here on the floor (laughs) with my hands closed, my legs folded, my eyes shut. My behavior at that particular point in time is perfect. So that means that uh, that's part of the training then of the perfection of behavior is when we just sit down and learn to do nothing. Because ultimately, we began to understand that most of what we've been doing our whole lives was irrelevant. And I could have been resting instead. Just like your question about, well, what happens at work when my idea is better than his? (laughs) (laughs) Well, we don't know that that's the case yet. But we do know that he does not agree with you. (laughs) But if we can take the point of view is that, oh, wouldn't it be marvelous if I could cheer him on and we both get benefit from his great idea? And if you let him do his idea and it fails, then you can say, I told you so. Both of those things are better than arguing with him in the first place. Oh, my idea is better than yours. And so this is the way that we begin to understand how the Dhamma works in the sense of bringing us down from that high energy level because 
you see, our society has lied to us. And the reason for that is, is that basically he who makes the rules gets all the gold. And he who has all the gold in the next generation will make all the rules. In other words, the rule systems for the society, especially with the government and business, is designed to exploit you. They want you to want to work. So that they can pay you a salary that you're satisfied with, or maybe not, but you're still being exploited. And our whole society is built upon that. I mean, look how much in, involved that is. If you don't work, you don't eat, right? That's not true here in Thailand. That's not at all true in Thailand. I'm involved with a with a with a great extended family, and that sometimes they're working and sometimes they're not. In fact, that got whole started from the um, uh, the society of of rice growing, because at one time they could only do one planting a year. Now they can do two, but they plant. They go to Bangkok. They hang out for a couple of months. They come back and they harvest. Then they do a little bit more than they plan again. And then they go back to Bangkok for three or four months. And then they come back and harvest again. And while they're in Bangkok, every big family will have like one apartment. And sometimes that apartment, they, there are so many people staying there, they have to sleep in shifts. Thai people are really easygoing. <laughs> Really easygoing people, but they're being bitten and poisoned by the same snake of Western people. They're beginning to become greedy, but they're efforts. And so uh, the society wants you to be greedy. They want you to be afraid. If you're not afraid, you won't vote. Wouldn't it be marvelous in the United States they had an election and nobody voted? Nobody voted. <laughs> the only people who voted were the ones who were running for office and nobody else voted. Because nobody cares. Because nobody's afraid. In fact, I've got a student in China and he and I have been talking about this. That in China... The government has a reason for the people to be happy. In fact, the government has got three major jobs to do. The first job that they had to do was to raise the standard of living up out of poverty. But by doing so, they nearly wrecked the environment. So now they've got this big greening project in, in, uh, in China. But underlying that is, is that they are actually looking for the well-being and happiness of the people. And for that reason... Uh, on the world index uh, listed in order by the uh, the country in order by the highest number of happiness in uh, northern Europe there they have the top 10 but China has moved from like number 59 up to 54 in the past several years they're really moving up while the United States has moved down from 17 down to 19 and getting even more miserable, more unhappy. And the reason for that is because the government and the politicians and big business has every reason to want people to be unhappy. Because if they're not unhappy, they won't vote. So this is this is one of the things that's very good for the students because what we're really talking about now is that second fetter. The second fetter is Sila Bata Paramasa. It it actually comes out of the nesting instinct because the nest was where uh, mammals and humans first started to have rules. Well, now the whole planet is a huge nest. And we do have a nest, of, a nest of rules. Oh, so many laws. Oh, so many things on the book. I mean, even the IRS codes is like, what, 80,000 pages. 
So we just got rules after rules after rules after rules. So many rules and no one individual person even knows all the rules. And they think that they need these rules for society to operate. Well, it, you do if you have a society of unhappy people. But if you've got a society of happy people, you don't need so many rules. But the societies that we have in the United States are designed intentionally to keep people unhappy. They want you to work. They want you to desire to work. They want you to be afraid so that they can keep you busy, so that they can exploit you. Well, now AI is coming, and uh-oh, we're going to have to change the model because now we've got a, bi- a billion, or let us say 300 million people uh, in the United States chomping at the bit to go to work, and there's no jobs. The robots have got them all. Uber has uh, cars out, but there's no drivers. And so we're going to have to change our model. That model change is going to be very, very tumultuous for the people of the United States. Because it it requires not just a major overhaul of the government. It's going to take a major overhaul of individuals' mind states. So I don't know what's going to happen. But as AI takes over, big, big changes. Well, as you see, China is already preparing for that. They're, they're already preparing for it. They want people to have good housing. They want people to have... Basically, what they want is they want the people so happy that they don't care about the government anymore. That's what the Chinese government wants. But that's not what the U.S people in the U.S. government want. They want people to really care about the government so that they'll vote for me. So this is a major issue that we all have to look at. And there is a um, there is a video. It's four hours long. The name of it is Century of the Self. Century of Cent- the Self. I'm going to write that down. Century of the it. Self. I got a pencil around here somewhere. <laughs> I'll remember it. All right. Century of the Self is the story that starts off with and follows along with the life of Edward Bernays, who was the actual nephew of Sigmund Freud. And what Edward Bernays did was he took the teachings of Freud off of the couch and into the industry. In other words, this is the buddings and the beginnings of what you would call industrial psychology. The psychology that businesses use to manipulate people as opposed to psychotherapy, which is designed to help people to become free. And when you see what that, uh, that, and it's four hours long, and it shows the entire history of the, of the 20th century of what's happened in the United States, and when people see that, they become disgusted with the fact that they have been bought, they have bought into that. It's not that, look what this uh, um, uh, uh, industrial psychology um armed big business has done to America is look what they have done to every individual one of us, including you and me. And we become disgusted with it. That's that second fetter is to recognize that we are in fact naturally, um, instinctually attached to rights, rules, and rituals. And so when, pe- when the big government sets down a set of new rules or new rituals to follow, we naturally just want to follow them, go along to get along or whatever like that, rather than recognizing, oh, no, that set of rules is exactly the same teaching as the teaching of comma, heaven, and hell. In other words, if there is no self, or no soul for God to kick around, then you are free from God's control. He has no control over you, not now, and not after you die. 
But we go one more step and we say, wait a minute, not only does God not have any control over me now or after I die, neither does big business, neither does big government, neither does big religion. None of them have control over me because there is no self. When I felt that there was a self to be controlled, then I was willing to go along with all of the controls. But now we recognize, oh, no, we can be free. We can be free. And that's the way to begin to look at it is, is that, yes, there are a lot of rules, but we're going to have a new rule. And when we have a very, very, really good rule, we only need one rule. We don't need 10,000 rules, 80,000 pages of IRS. What rule do we need? What's the one rule? Suffering and no suffering, the teaching of the Buddha. That's the only rule that we need. Which means now we have to have a completely different orientation. In the old days, we had to be mindful to follow all the rules. Now we have to uh, develop our mindfulness to look at one thing. Suffering and no suffering. That's our new job to do. When we understand that that's the new job to do, now we're addressing the third fetter. The first fetter, personality view. The second fetter, attachments to rites, rules, and rituals, thinking that there has some benefit therein. Not recognizing that by following all the rites, rules, and rituals that were given, we are still not free from suffering. Now that we're working on the uh, Eightfold Noble Path, we come to understand that, oh, there is a way. There is a way of living besides the way that society or religions or governments or whatever says to do it. And that is the way of the Buddha, the way of suffering and no suffering, the way of the Eightfold Noble Path, the way of the Four Noble Truths. This is the way that we should live. When we see that, that's when all doubt about what life is all about can be freed up. We know. We know there's no rebirth, no reincarnation, no heavens, no hells, except those that I make for myself. And that I'm not under the control of anyone that you are absolutely free to do as you please. And that you can feel the way that you want to feel once you learn how to control feelings. So this is what makes the, the path of the Buddha so marvelous is because it gives you self-control, but this kind of self is a different kind of self. This is when the mind becomes unit are unified, and we become a solid uh, force that has several characteristics, and one of the primary characteristics is freedom from doubt. Freedom from doubt about what is the way to live our lives. Freedom from doubt about what is the path and what is not the path. That's the third better is doubt. Now, how we get free from these three fetters is by paying wise attention to the four noble truths, especially the second noble truth, the causes of suffering. Because when we can see the causes of suffering, we can throw it out. This gives us now quite a skill set that is developed. The skill set that's developed is right mindfulness, right effort, Right attitude, all under the umbrella of right noble view. And that this is the way that we lived. In fact, this is the way we got to the point of being free from doubt, is by practicing with this part of the Eightfold Noble Path, right from the very beginning. When the mind wanders away, never mind, start again, come back to the breath. And so it's the same thing over and over and over again. Now, one of the things that you could probably agree with me is, is that the world is full of good advice. That sometimes the Bible has good advice, not always. Sometimes Christianity has good advice, not always. Sometimes the government has good advice, 
sometimes even the state of Texas legislature has some good advice. Not always. Good advice is all over the place. Good advice is not the issue. Good advice, in fact, is only good when we can remember that good advice at the right time when we need it most. And so that's basically the teaching of the Buddha in a nutshell. It's not about, because he's got the absolute best advice. The absolute best advice is suffering and no suffering. But we cannot remember to do that unless we remember to do that. <laughs> and that's why sati is so important, is to remember over and over again. And so we want to practice that over and over again. Now, many students, when they begin to sit and practice, they say, oh, I'm going to sit longer and longer, and I'm going to take my mind into deeper and deeper places of meditation. That's not necessarily the right way to practice. Because if they go deep into meditation, then that's like, the example would be, if you had a dog that was tied to a tree, or locked in a cage about 50 feet away. If you call that dog, will he come? The answer is no, he's tied up. He's locked in a cage. He's not even going to try. But if the dog is out in the yard and you say, come on, Lucky, here, boy, here, boy. Come on, Lucky, 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 Lucky. He'll come. This is the way that we want to look at sati or look at the mind. It's not whether we can take the mind and lock it into a cage. It's whether that when it is not locked in the cage, will it come when it's called? So this is the distinction between Vipassana and jhana meditation. Jhana meditation is locking the mind into a cage. Vipassana is, will it come when it's called? Does it remember to come? That's the whole point. And if we can gain that skill of sati to remember, to come back and 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 to come back, then the time when it's most likely for us to get stuck into something, we can come back even then too. So for instance, someone at work yells at you and you have no mindfulness, you're probably going to feel bad. You're wondering why he's yelling at you. You'll blame him. You'll think that he's angry and that you've done something wrong and that, or you've got to defend yourself and now you're yelling back, okay? But if you have sati at that point in time, when he yells at you, you can say, oh, there's a bad feeling in there. Let me breathe into that and feel nice for a moment. And I don't even have to think about him or his yelling. I can think about feeling good for a moment settle myself, and to now when I speak to him, I can speak to him with wisdom rather than as a reaction. Okay, so this is a clear example of why we need to develop sati, because you already have the good advice. You already know what to do. The question is, can you remember to do that when you need it most? In that regard, the teachings of the Buddha is actually quite simple. Because now all we need to do is have a list of things to look for. And we've been covering that list quite well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> recognizing doubt, recognizing feelings, recognizing liking and not liking and that kind of stuff. So this is the way that we want to, to practice, not at a theoretical level, or at a very deep mind state level, but as a, a level of practice that allows us to be Johnny on the spot, mm -hmm. to come back and do the right thing at the right moment, to be on alert, to be on guard, as it were, to stand at attention, to, to watch what's going on. That's the real teaching of the Buddha, is to watch what's going on, because only by seeing what's going on can you do something about it? And so we start with the body 
because the body is going to be a source of a lot of feelings and a lot of sensation. Anxiety, for instance, will be normally for most people up in the middle part of the chest. Some people, it's deeper, like butterflies in the stomach or whatever like that. But whenever you have it, uh, sensations, one of them will be the tight, tightness of the, of, the, of the throat. Because of why? The answer is, think about an lion. If the lion is killing a gazelle, how does he kill it? Goes for the neck. Go for the neck, exactly. <laughs> so, what happens when people are in an argument? So, raise their shoulders for protection. Mm-hmm. They'll tighten their throat. Where do you think the word redneck comes from, anyway? Do you think it's because the old partner stands out in the sun? Oh, no, the redneck comes because of the hatred the racial hatred that they have. That's what the word term redneck means is when <laughs> So these are bodily things that we can become aware of. And you can see these things not only in your own body, but in other people's bodies too. This is actually what we mean by now is the first noble truth of there is suffering, which means bear is suffering look at it here it is it's showing itself right in front of you right inside your own body right inside the bodies or right outside the bodies that you can see of others that are around you this is where suffering exists it's self-evident it's obvious and in fact it's a very very good change of uh view when the guy is yelling at you, we normally think he's angry. What's the problem? A better way of looking at it is, is that, oh, this guy's in suffering. He needs compassion. We begin to see angry people not as angry, but as sufferers. And so we begin to have more compassion. In fact, it can be stated that right view noble right view is the same thing as compassion to have an overall compassionate view that doesn't come to any conclusions by the way that's another quality of noble right view is is that it actually is the investigation and so a uh, right view and investigation wind up being the same thing wrong view is investigating a little bit and coming to a conclusion and think you know what the answer is if you're right then that's ordinary right view and if you're wrong then obviously that's wrong view but super mundane right view is not coming to any conclusions isn't that interesting that's what this is all about is not coming to conclusions because if you come to a conclusion, you've got work to do. Yeah, or you're coming to a dead end, whereas right view is open-ended. Always open. Yeah. Always easy to work with. Doesn't, doesn't limit us. And also we recognize that joy is a major component. Without joy then we, without the ability to manufacture joy in the mind, we also have no ability to change the way we feel. But by manufacturing joy in the mind, and how do you manufacture joy in the mind? By having happy thoughts. Tell yourself a Buddhist joke or two once in a while. I've got a couple. (laughs) A Christian and an atheist were in a bar fighting with each other over whether the existence of hell or not. You know the Christians and atheists are always fighting about it. And uh, the atheist says, there ain't no hell. And the Christian says, the hell there ain't. (laughs) And the Buddhist is standing there, and he says gently to both of them, grabs them both by the shoulder and says, hell, you're both in it right now. (laughs) That's a good one. That's a good one, isn't it? You've heard the one about uh, uh, the hot dog on Broadway. No, Make me so. one with everything. 
And then change comes right when you pay for it, and the vendor doesn't give the a change back, and he says change comes from within. Oh, but right, that's right, an right. old one. That's yeah, an yeah. old, 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 old one. So anyway, this is where we can gladden the mind. We can tell ourselves jokes. We can think of happy things. Uh, but the best one of all is the joy of recognizing that we can be here just right now. This present moment is actually quite marvelous. And so coming to be here now is a very joyful thing to do. Getting into this state for some people and in the beginning for everyone, hard work. So we have to apply right effort. The right effort is is to come out of uh, whatever mind state that we were in, to come out of whatever thoughts that we were in, and come into a joyful, be here now. So that's one's right effort in the beginning. And here's the thing that I think, and I mentioned this when we were talking to Willie, that this effort becomes energetic. It becomes almost automatic. That as you begin to practice, as soon as you recognize that the mind has wandered away, or as soon as you recognize that uh, that the mind is in the past, it takes no effort at all to come to the present moment. It's just, here we are. <laughs> mm-hmm. The effort is almost now spring-loaded. Right, yeah. No, I, I catch, I ca- it's easy to come to the present moment now for me. It's sometimes, yeah, it's just, usually it's because I notice... Um, like like the thought and emotion playing and i i'm very like mindful of my emotions and i can see something like spiraling out of control and i'm like oh wait a second that's what i usually that's that's like my main focus like off cushion is just keeping a you know a finger on the pulse of like emotions because that's when i can notice that i usually sense it emotionally first and then the thought i'm like oh it's because of this I, I trace it and then snap back into now. Excellent. That's that's exactly what the practice is. So now go do that another million times and then call me. <laughs> 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 that million times shouldn't take you but a day or two. Right. <laughs> Just keep coming back and coming back and coming back. You don't have to count, by the way. But um, the whole point about sati is to remember, to come back to remember, to be here now, to not get the mind off someplace. This, by the way, is such a marvelous tool to stay out of the past. Whenever anything that's this over a day old comes to mind, be on guard for it so that you can throw it out. More than likely, if you think about it, let us say that you have thoughts of a house that you li- used to live in. If you start thinking about the house that you used to live in and the rooms that you were in and uh, the people in those, in those rooms, Eventually, within just a few moments of of thinking about that old house, you'll run across something that happened in that house that was very painful. And now you're stuck right into the full memory of it. And we start to feel guilty, or we start to feel angry, or we start all kinds of stuff. And there was no need for us to do that, because there's nothing that we can do about that past event. What happened in that house back then is gone now, and there's nothing we can do except feel bad about it. Yeah, and I we think only what, feel when we think, and so better not to think about the past. Yeah, I, I, uh, I catch myself reminiscing about like the past and nostalgia about old friends and old, you know, times from before. And yeah, you know, at first it's kind of pleasant, and then yeah, it will slowly turn to you know, missing it and then feeling that now is not adequate or something like that, like that does tend to happen. Mm -hmm. Here's the reason for that. The memories that we have didn't get properly registered in the sense of we didn't, um, 
We weren't conscious of everything that happened. When we were perceiving things and figuring things out, we were also miss, missing details. And then what we stored rots in our brains so that our memories are not very good. And then when we bring that memory back out, as we're bringing it out, we're bringing it out with more processing. And so it deteriorates further. The human memory is not a good memory system. It's just not. There's many examples. For instance, on your laptop, do you have any movies? Even one? No. Have you ever watched a movie on YouTube? Yes. Okay. Do you remember every frame of that movie? Every Never. pixel? Do you remember every line of dialogue? No, my memory is not that great anyways. <laughs> no. Okay. No one's memory is. Yeah. That that shows that uh, YouTube's computers or your computer, if you download that movie, is far superior to ours. In fact, that's what re reading and writing is all about. The reason that human beings started having language that was written down was because back then we knew that memory was not good enough. So that's why we started record keeping is because the, the record keeper up here is just not adequate mm -mm. for that. That reason alone is better not to use it. Whenever we have an opportunity to not use it, don't. Because it's going to drudge up some stuff that that we can feel bad over that may have never even happened. Right. So one of the stories of looking at that is like the people who go into an uh, into a meeting. You got, let us say, eight, nine, ten people in that meeting, and everybody has their something to say, and they do a discussion, and then the chairman says, "Okay, we're going to do it this way," and everybody leaves the meeting, and everybody who leaves the meeting leaves with a different version of that meeting. The only way for us to know for sure what happened in that meeting was for it to be in video recorded. But those eight people can watch that video again and still come up with eight different views of that video. <laughs> right. Consensus is hard to come by because memory is not very good. But the point then is, is that these people who go to that meeting and then come back away from that meeting, every one of them can start to figure out things that were bad about the meeting. Where in the meeting, the meeting was fine. Mm -hmm. But after the meeting, now the students are the, uh, the, the members of the meeting. They go and start trashing that meeting in their minds. This is, this is something that for us to understand. That thinking about the past is sure to drudge up suffering. Thinking about the past is sure to bring up problems that don't need to be solved. Thinking and rummaging around in the past is for sure going to wind up us being on the trash heap of whatever we lost. Okay, an example of that is, is that when you were young, you had a really beautiful, nice motorcycle and it went into a wreck. And now at your, in your old age, you think about that motorcycle and every time you do, there's a deep kind of <clears throat> feeling. Oh, I lost it. Oh, I had it, and now it's lost. And that kind of remorse is uh, very, very common because there's very little that you have now that you had 10 years ago, or a better way of saying there's very little that you had 10 years ago that you've still got. Oh, very God. little. You've got different clothes, different headsets, different eyewear. Everything keeps changing. But if we think about something that we lost, then we'll suffer. So we have all of these reasons now that I'm putting together for you to start to be on guard to not think about the past. Whenever you're thinking about the past, you can say, aha, I caught you. Come out of the past and come into the present moment. Be here now. Be happy. Don't solve old problems. Because you don't have any problems. Right. <laughs> and, and so practicing this way 
the problem set comes down. Sometimes people feel overwhelmed with how much stuff that they've got to do. But there's two ways to do it. Either you can do one thing pleasantly at a time, enjoying your way through it one at a time, or you can, while you're doing that one thing, you can think about how much more work you've got to do and what a struggle it is. So you can either progress your way through happily the work that you've got to do, or you can suffer under the weight of it as you're trotting through it. All of it has to do with the mental state that one is in. And in fact, doing that little bit of work or doing that work happily is not so much work anymore. It only becomes work when you don't like to do it. And when we think we got a lot of work to do, that means that we got a lot of we got a lot we got to do a lot of stuff we don't want to do. <laughs> so an, a unit or an integrated mind or a mind that is unified then is not going to be caught in that bind because we give ourselves less and less work to do and when the work that we do do we do in the present moment knowing that i can stop doing this and go do something else at any time that i want to you become free from the clock Free from the clock. You can do what you please. Do as you like. This is what we mean by freedom. The Pali word is mok or moksha. The Thai name of Wat Soan Mok is actually the Garden of Liberation. It's actually got a longer name, Wat Soan Mok Belaram, but Belaram is uh, uh, royal power. So it's the power of liberation the garden of the power of liberation. But moksha is, or mok is the word that we're looking at here. And we can use that word as liberty and freedom or whatnot. Now, young people look at freedom in the sense of freedom too. Daddy, can I go to town? Freedom to go do this, freedom to go do that. But uh, wisdom teaches us that real freedom is freedom from. So I'm free from having to go to town. Don't have to go to town. You got to go to the bank. Well, I can go tomorrow. <laughs> but you see how much of the, uh, the whole society, even the self-help books, sometimes even the Buddhist religion books, will talk about how to get over procrastination. All right. That means that they want you to do something. Stop putting it off. Don't be lazy. The answer is be lazy. <laughs> if something needs to be done and you're putting it off and you're thinking about it, then the right way to do it is an example of that was a student who um, um, she would do her housework. But she would worry about getting it done. So she'd start the weekend and she wouldn't get it done. I said, okay, this is the thing to do then is to set an appointment. Let us say at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning for just one hour. And you're going to clean house for just one hour. And then you're going to stop. When 11 o'clock comes and now you're not cleaning the house, that's procrastination. But we misunderstand procrastination because we think of any time I think of something and then don't do it then, now I'm procrastinating. Right. But a Dhamma dude says I'm not doing it now because why should I bother? <laughs> <laughs> Let me enjoy the moment instead. So this is this is also one of the places where there is a deep inter intersection between Zen and Theravada. There's many places uh, with Zen, they, they are, let us say, completely practical without any uh, theoretical or philosophical underpinnings. In other words, Zen doesn't even talk about suffering and no suffering. But they still wind up with haiku like this. No place to go and nothing to do. 
and the spring comes and the grass grows by itself. Nothing, that's the whole haiku, you know. You know about Japanese haiku, right. 17 syllables, okay. No place to go and nothing to do, and the spring comes and the grass grows by itself. The grass doesn't even need your help. It grows by itself. Okay, so that's that's the way of saying nature takes care of itself, does not need my help. That my job is to sit and be happy, a happy human being with nothing to do and no place to go. But you can see that mentality, how antithetical it is to the society that you were raised in. Oh, yeah. And the Buddha knew that. That's why he actually listed it as the second fetter. But really, there is nothing to do. There is no place to go. We can just sit here and enjoy the moment. Get out of the past because the past is what you're going to use as a springboard for more work to do that doesn't really need to be done. And if you think about it at a kind of a global scale, look that the human beings could have had so much fun enjoying such a beautiful planet but because of our greed we're destroying the poor thing the outback of australia has been literally torn up to take all the coal out of it not to mention what has happened in kentucky and west virginia and whatnot like that they've just destroyed the place and then you go to Galveston. Whoa, have you ever yeah. been to Galveston? Yeah. yeah. So you, wow, what a major mess humans have made of this planet. Oh, yeah. All because we had something to do. Yeah. And so, and so the way of looking at it then is to look at it from the sense of what is basic? What do we need? What's the sort of baseline? And the Buddha says is that if we have adequate clothing, adequate food, adequate shelter, and adequate medical attention, just the basics, then there's nothing else we need to do. We don't need any more than that. So we can just lay about and just have a, have a really wonderful life because we've got those four basics. And yet you look at Los Angeles and housing is inadequate. Yeah. A lot of food is inadequate. A lot of people are in suffering in the United States because they don't have the very basic necessities. But those who have the basic necessities, they all still think it's still not enough. Right. And then you become Charles Koch. And you have to share the $70 billion with your brother. And I've only got 35, and he's got 35 billion dollars. Not enough. <laughs> Let's buy a government to get some lower taxes so we can make some more money. Greed, right. greed, 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 greed. That's what makes uh, the American way of life the way it is. And that's why there's so much suffering. But if each individual one of us, or at least a few of us, can come out of that mentality of more is better, which means that only a few have way too much and many others don't even have adequate. The question is, can you come up to the state of adequacy and then stop? Right. Because your happiness is not going to be dependent upon how much good you have over a basic level. That more money, more wealth, more power, it doesn't make us more secure. Only the mind state of being insecure, which is one of the mental powers which we'll talk about another day. But I want to talk today about these three fetters, because when a student comes to that point of recognizing that there is no path other than the Eightfold Noble Path, and that you 
<laughs> I know that sounds very Muslim, doesn't it? <laughs> I didn't mean it to, send, to sound quite that way. Because you can see that that is just ignorance packed really tight together to where the real issue that we're looking for is the eradication of doubt because you've got the actual demonstration. You know what it's like to have your mind free from hindrances. You know what it's like to have your mind fit for work. You know what it's like to be free from uh, delusions of the self, to be free from uh, the rules of society, and to be free from doubt about how we should live. This state, then, that we're coming to with these three fetters, when we come to that, then we know that this is the third knowledge on the path, the third of the thir- of the uh, of seven noble knowledges. And when we say noble, in the sense that ordinary people don't have that. Ordinary people, for instance, don't even have the first one. They do not have that uh, that that virtue in the sense of no matter how obstructed the mind is, we can throw it out, because Christians are taught exactly opposite of that. They're taught, oh, I'll have sinned. You're a sinner, which means right now you're a sinner too. And you need Jesus as your Savior. And so they perform a ceremony, maybe a baptism. And now you're baptized in in Jesus and you're saved from your sins. That was on Sunday night. On Monday morning, we're back into sin again. The ceremony didn't work. Let's go back and tell the preacher, hey, you baptized me. And I should be free from sin, but I still hate your guts. <laughs> <laughs> Baptize me again so I'll love you or something. <laughs> and, and we begin to see that these rituals, these behaviors, these um, uh, ways of doing things do not eliminate suffering. And so we no longer cleave to those ways of doing things, and we take, in, take on a new one-rule world. And that one rule is suffering and no suffering. That's the path. That's the third knowledge. And when we come to that, that's a remarkable change. In fact, that's the kind of the teeter-totter that takes one off of the path of soda pond into the fruit of soda pond because now we're actually getting benefit from the teachings of the Buddha. Okay, so this is this is what we mean by kind of that fulcrum point, that once we come to understand that this is the path beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I have knowledge and vision that this is the path, and I have also knowledge and vision of what is not the path. What is not the path? The way everybody's been telling me. The Christian path is not the path. The Attorney General's path is not the path. (laughs) Bar that. The government's way of doing things, that's not the path that ends suffering. Now, we can understand that the society we live in are these nesting rules. They, They were needed because without them, there's nothing but chaos. There's nothing but ill will. There's nothing but anger and hatred and greed. And for that reason, that would be wrong. So it is right for society to have rules, but it's only ordinary right view because people still suffer. It only does part of the job. One would even question, does it even do half the job? Right. So the real work to do of removing suffering has to do because we're mindful. We watch. When it comes up, grab it. Say, out you go, out you go. And we keep cleaning the mind over and over and over again a million times, and we become um, able to maintain a state where we can be here now happily without any work to do, with no place to go, 
It's just the way that we live. And we're mindful and watchful. So this is capable. We're capable of doing this. And you don't have to be a monk hidden away in the back forest of Thailand to do this. Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa was very, very much up on that. That in fact he kind of discouraged Westerners from from trying to go and be monks because the culture of Thailand is so different than the right. West. So different. Um, for one thing, the uh, the Thai culture of the of the temple is very familiar to the kids who would become monks. But you've never been around a Buddhist temple. You have no clue about what it's really like. And so if you drop all their stuff and come to Thailand and say, I want to be a Buddhist monk, boy, are you in for a surprise. <laughs> and for that reason, Westerners are not um, encouraged to be monks. They're encouraged instead, the way that I talk about it, just to be Dhamma dudes, to live your life a, no a, a noble life. If you can come up to living a noble life, then that's enough. If you want to finish the job and to go all the way to Arahat, that's when you should consider leaving your job, leaving the country, leaving the society, and go off so that you can really get the mind cleared out. But you can get your mind free from probably about 90% of the suffering without ever having to go be a monk. Right. Cost benefit ratio. Yeah. It does sound tempting at times, but it's mostly when I'm having a hard time is when I you know, when I think about oh ordaining, but then most of the time I'm pretty happy and I'm like, nah, it's not necessary. Like I can I can I my practice is moving forward fine swimmingly the way like the you know, the life that I have now, which is you know, uh which is just do the pretty much the bare necessities. <laughs> yes. That's one of the songs. Let's see. That, that's from the Jungle Book, a Disney right. movie, I think, in the 1960s. Bare where necessities. The, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we were singing YouTube. that last time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of good songs like that. Yeah. Huna Matata is another one coming from the uh, um, Lion King. Uh, Lion King, right. Yeah. No worries for the rest of my days. Yeah. Too bad kids don't read, don't learn those songs and live them. Right. Yeah. No, it's like it's like oh, that was funny. That was in a movie, but that's not how the real world is, kids. <laughs> But that's the problem. The real world is not like that real world, kid, because we're unhappy, uptight, and greedy and right. want things. And we don't understand that we could live in that world. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome to that world. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, let's finish this talk up, and we'll go next time for yeah. a little bit more. But I think that you're beginning to understand how easy this practice is once we focus on gaining that skill, developing that skill of sati, because the other four or the other three will move along right with it. That right view, right sati, right effort, and the right attitude run and circle around each other. And so the kick is sati. If you can remember, then you can bring those guy, the other three along. Or well, actually, already. underlying was already there. The right view was already there. And so the development of sati, that's what we need. Just keep remembering that there's no worries. All right, Donrado, thank you. Okay. Well, we'll see you. Yeah, see you soon. Appreciate it. Okay. All righty. Bye-bye.